It's the day before the day before New Year's Eve. Have you got resolutions? We'll talk about it today. I am redeemed. for you on Monday, the 29th. Oh, no, the 30th, sorry, of December. And uh, usually we don't date our shows because we want to be able to play them back, and I don't want you to think that they're old shows. But today we're going to talk about New Year's resolutions. And so I think it's important that you know we are the day before, New Year's Eve of 2013 to 2014. And resolutions are something that I think everybody makes, except Bob. We talked about this yesterday on the national show he doesn't make uh new year's resolutions hasn't in what 30 years oh i don't say that long you know probably 15 years okay um but i I, i've got some uh and i'm getting to the age this sounds terrible i'm getting to the age where my new year's resolutions are really more bucket list oh you know making sure that i get some things done this year off of my bucket list because my bucket list is kind of, uh, it's not just the name of a movie. It's kind of important to me. And so uh, uh, what would be the difference, Bob, between a bucket list and a New Year's resolution? Well, they're both things that you want to do, okay. okay, that you want to accomplish. So they're very similar. But the bucket list is, you, you, the bucket list you have to add before I die, right? Yeah, but resolutions, of course, that would also be before you die. Okay, yeah, that's true. You know. That's true. That's true. But a bucket list seems like it would be fun. <laughs> resolutions <laughs> may not be. Um, yeah, that's a good point, too. That's a good point, too. Because my, you see, I don't, I'm to the point in my life where I don't have any of those. I mean, yeah, I'd like to lose some weight, but I don't care if I do anymore. Um, I'd like to, uh, um, yeah, I think they're mostly bucket lists. Yeah, mm-hmm. so I want to introduce you to our uh, special guest. Move right up to that microphone there. How are you today, sir? I'm doing just fine, and how are you? I'm good, and what do we call you? Um, You're I'm alive. A recovering alcoholic. Okay. <laughs> but Gregory? Gre- Gregory Jones. All right, Gregory Jones. Gregory, we sure thank you for coming in today and uh, being a part of the show. And uh, uh, how long have you been a recovering alcoholic? Um, 25 years. Do you have 25 years of consistent sobriety? No. No. Well, no, none of us do. Well, you. Yeah. You never relapsed, did you? No. Wow. Well, it depends. Once I set my mind to it, no. Well, see, I, 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 somebody asked me the other day, well, no, this is months ago, if I had ever relapsed. And I said, nope. And then I thought, you know, that's not true. Because my first DUI, I <laughs> went through Powell to go through the motions, you know, to make the judge happy. And as soon as I got out of Powell, what did I do? I went back drinking, but I didn't think I had a problem. My second DUI, my first was in 94. My second one came in 02. Same thing again. Well, I'll just go through the treatment center and do all that. And then the third time I tried to quit, I quit for 21. My best friend challenged me. See if you can go three weeks without drinking. So I went 21 days. And on the evening of the 21st, or on the evening of the 21st day, I took all my buddies out and we had martinis. Oh, God. Because I thought, well, look, I went 21 days, you know. So I have to say that I've, I've had relapses also. But, um, so, but you've been working this program, Gregory, for 25 years. No, actually, when I, when I say that I recover, I've, I've been in recovery, it's because I believe that from the time that the seed was planted in me that I could recover from alcoholism by going to AA, I believe that that seed um, always led me to believe that if I ever just could make it back to AA, that I would be all right. It was like playing Russian roulette, but I knew that there was a place for me to recover. And that would be a 12-step program. A, yes, um, yes. Yeah, a, 12 a, a traditional 12-step program. program. Yeah. So uh, tell, we're going to talk about resolutions a little bit as the show goes on, but <laughs> mainly just focused on your story. So where's home? Where were you born and raised? Um, Buffalo, New York. Buffalo, New York. Buffalo, home. It's cold up there. Buffalo Bills. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not as cold as it get here. I think that's a misconception. We get a lot of snow here, but you guys get the 30 and the 40 below, and I'm yeah. not used to that. And yeah. I used to work on the shores of Lake Erie, 
and it, it never got this cold here. Like, it but is. they have more snow there. But got, yeah, we get we get it by the foot, by by yeah, by the foot. <laughs> now, so, wh when did you move to Des Moines? Uh, four years ago. And what brought you here? Um, geographical cure. Just wanted to get out of the. Um, I was living in Niagara Falls with a girlfriend, and we were living in a crack house, and um, we had to go somewhere. So she said, um, it's an interesting story. She said, just pick a, a place out of the top of your head. And I sat and I pondered for a while, and I thought about it. And I had been through Des Moines, passed through, and um, it was like either going to be Davenport or Des Moines. Don't ask me why. I don't know, but the only thing I know about Des Moines is that the Greyhound bus used to pass through here when I was coming from Colorado. Mm -hmm. And I remember one day that I went to get me a can of beer for the, you know, to, to get, because I needed to drink while I was on the bus. And I walked into the, um, I walked into the come and go across the street from the, from the uh, bus station and I looked into the cooler and I could not believe what I saw. I saw Thunderbird wine, Wild Irish Rose wine. And I was like, and that was it. I was so happy. I, you know, I, I got, I stuck a couple of bottles in my sock. I drank one behind the store, and I got back on the bus. But that is all that I know about Des Moines. That, it, that for one minute, I was very happy when I saw that wine. Because we had Thunderbird beer. wine. Yeah. Well, hey, my, my wine. I've never choice. heard that someone moved here for that. Thunderbird. <laughs> no, I didn't move here for that. Well, it that. brought you some happiness for a while. And then. Well, when she asked me where to go, I didn't, I didn't have any where else you know to think of so i think it was subconsciously i yeah. just popped up des moines yeah so now is are, are you and that young lady still together um we're friends we're friends we're okay very good. good friends yes so you've been in des moines four years yes and have you been uh when when was the last drink that you took how long ago uh it'll be four years on the 12th of january wow yeah it'll so be four years. des moines is is a sober town for you yes sober yeah i came here i drank for maybe a a week or two, or let's say a month or two. And then um, I plugged in the Alcoholics Anonymous, and I haven't had a drink or a drug since. And why do you think it was easier in Des Moines than it was in Buffalo, New York? Um, I mean, you I didn't think, have... I think it's the history. I think yeah. it's, it's, it's the deep roots, the deep history, the family, the... Um, you associate things at home. Yeah. And, and Yeah. And, and and Buffalo, the east side of Buffalo, where I'm from, is a is a community, a very large community that is devastated by drugs and alcoholism, alcoholism and drugs. I I went there uh, this past April, and when I was riding down one of the streets that I used to frequent, it brought tears to my eyes. I wow. could not believe it was like like Beirut. Wow. Really, the devastation, the, 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 the burnt out buildings, the people pushing the carts, the grocery carts with their furniture on it and going into the thrift stores for clothes. And I mean, not the thrift stores, the free, the church was giving away, yeah. give the away stuff all day. But I, I brought tears to my eyes. I could not believe it that I had survived in that. And, th and well, not thrived, but I survived in it. So uh, Gregory is our guest today. Tell me, <laughs> Um, you were you born in Buffalo? Yes, and I was so, born and raised in Buffalo. Uh, how many siblings did you have? Um, I have seven, um, two sisters and five brothers. Okay, and I brought my brother Sam with me today. Okay, for and support. So there was eight of you all together. <laughs> yes. Now, when you say you brought your brother Sam, you have a picture of Sam. Yeah, I have a photo of Sam. Sam died uh, this year. Why don't you hand me that picture, and I'll make sure we see it on the camera. Okay. So this is his younger brother? or No, older? that's my brother. He's right one age, one year up above me. Aww. Can you zoom in on that for me uh, there? And we'll just see. That's your brother, Sam. And he died when? He died in, in, in March of this year. And, and he and died. Hmm? Go ahead. He died as a direct result of, of, of alcoholism. I mean, and I'm not saying that he ingested alcohol. I'm saying that um, the alcoholism in my family led him to have nervous breakdowns, and he developed uh, one of the worst cases of uh, schizophrenia that I've ever seen in my life. And I, I'm probably saying that from a, from a prejudice, seeing that he's my brother and all, but um, he died basically of malnutrition. He, couldn't he didn't take care of himself. He's smoking stuff. So he smoked cigarettes and drank coffee and for a very long time, and he lived very, a very lonely life, uh, um, just a Did horrible. Did he stay in Buffalo? Yes, he stayed yeah. in, in Buffalo. 
horrible. He lived a horrible life. A horrible. Okay, hard question. Why did he live that type of life? Like he he became uh, schizophrenic, mental yeah. illness. Okay. And he could not, um, you know, he was in the system for a while, but he, you know, he still continued to hang around my family during their alcoholism and stuff. And that kept him unable to break free from, um, to deal with his own schizophrenia. And that just let him down. Was your mother and father an alcoholic? Yes. And all your siblings? Uh, interesting. No, I, I believe that out of all of my brothers and sisters, that myself and my brother David are the only alcoholics. Really? And that was a misconception that I've carried on my life, that I thought that everybody in my family were alcoholics. But I've just realized that um, it's me and my brother David that suffer from So the Sam disease. wasn't an alcoholic. He had a mental disorder. He had a mental disorder. And my other brothers, they, they, my brothers and sisters, they have living problems associated <coughs> from my parents' alcoholism. There now there's drug addiction, <coughs> there's gambling addiction, and other type of addictions. My sister, they, my sisters, they have living problems, but they don't suffer. They can drink. Yeah, you know, my brothers, they can drink, and I just realized that just very recently that it was like a light. Like, wow, was that a good thing? Yes, it was very okay. good because um, when I finally realized that what was wrong with my family was alcoholism, when I realized <coughs> that. And that it wasn't that we were bad people or that my father was an evil person. Um, it was alcoholism. And that was, that I, I was driving down Army Post Road, um, going to work in rush hour traffic. And when I realized that my parents suffered from alcoholism and my family did, I, st I, I slammed on the brakes in, in traffic. It was that wow. startling, yeah. So when you came to Des Moines, were you trying to escape your family? Or get away from your alcoholism? My, my alcoholism. Yeah. yeah, and I was chasing this woman. Yeah. You know, I had been chasing her all over the country. Yeah. So, and um, we settled here, and I, I continued to drink, and she put me out. And I went to the Bethel Mission, and I stayed there for two months, and I went on to the Door of Faith. Mm -hmm. And I stayed there for 14 months, and I've been out in working and everything for the last two years great but i have a story i wanted to tell you about pow okay all right now why don't you hold that story for just a second as we're coming up on a hard break okay and i give you a chance to tell that but what did your well what did, did your father work consistently no no my father never worked really <clears throat> basically he could never hold a job for more than a month or two because of his alcoholism all right drinking so did your mother hold a job consistently no no. How, how did how were the bills paid? Well, my father was a thief. Okay. Like a very good thief. And New York State um, is very liberal with, with their welfare benefits and their food stamps and their food, their rent vouchers and their Medicaid and all of that. And it supports families. It supported my, my family for the 16 years of my life that I lived with my family. Do you think it, it benefited you and your family that the New York system basically supported you no. all? No. You would have wished that some of those or a lot of those weren't available to force your mom and dad to work? Right, because we would sit around every 1st and 16th of the month, and we would watch the food stamps walk out the door and the cash and the money for clothes because there was, like, gambling going on. My house was basically, it was a gambling hall. People would come in, I mean, month after month after month, year after year after year, you, you watch that. You watch your dad gamble away all of the money. I mean, just yeah. you know what's going to happen every two weeks. Yeah. Every two weeks, you know what's going to happen, and you, you know, and it does something to you. D d are your mother and father still living? No. No. D what no. did they pass from? Alcoholism. My my father died from he was um, smoking crack, and he died from a heart attack. Okay. And my mother, she died of um, emphysema. She um she but she lived. Uh, about 12 years after my father died. So, All right, our guest today is Gregory, a hometown boy of Buffalo, New York, from uh, Des Moines, uh, here the last four years. And he's been sober a little over four years, and we'll talk about that. He's got a story for Powell, and we're talking about New Year's resolutions. What's the difference between that and a bucket list? That's today, live on Recovery Monday, brought to you by Powell CDC and webcast1live.com. father 
who is headed toward another heart attack. A woman who struggles daily with diabetes and her memory. A boy whose headaches keep him out of school. A mother who one morning discovers a lump. A girl whose condition defies diagnosis. You come to us because you need answers, but you also need more. You need understanding of what you're going through. You need comfort. You need to be treated as an individual, not a condition. You need to be included in your own care. You are the point of everything we do. That's why we're changing to Unity Point Health. It's a model of care that will help us work better together, where the physician who knows you best takes the lead, coordinating your care through every step, from the hospital to specialists, to rehabilitation, to health services in the home and in the community, to making sure the treatments are effective. By working as a team, we surround you with care, helping you manage your health and your conditions, guiding you to making better choices and living a healthier life. The point of unity is you. Unity Point Health. Hey, psst. Let me let you in on a little secret. You ready? Always try to do business with people, not places. Especially if you seek honest Christian business people. And when it comes to my car, I really need to trust who's working on it. Now, my family is so blessed. A few years ago, we found a family-owned automobile repair shop that operates as a Christian business also. Open, honest, reliable, trustworthy. It's Amco on Hickman Road in front of Kmart. And it's a family-owned Christian operating business. This family treats your car as if it was their car. Everything from oil changes to transmission repair and everything in between. So the next time you feel the need to be at peace with your choice of who you can trust with your car, give Amco on Hickman a chance to serve you. And tell them Max sent you. If Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of America was your personal webmaster, Tom would filter out all bad debt emails. If Tom was your mailman, you'd never get any debt reduction junk mail. If Tom Coates was a lineman, he'd block any phone calls offering to reduce your credit card debt. Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America, and we're still your best choice for credit counseling. We're local, we're accountable, and we can do more. You make the call when the time's right for you. When it comes to competition, there really is none for Consumer Credit of America. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Welcome back. Recovery Monday on this 30th day of December, the last Monday, the last show for the year. Next week, we begin 2014. And if you are an individual who has uh, gone through recovery and you have a story to share, we'd like to hear from you. Um, it, your story, no matter what it is, God will use that. Your greater power, a power greater than yourself, will use that to help somebody else down the line. Something Gregory says today something the cat in the hat, something Lila, something I say today will be landed on the ears of someone who needed to hear just that at that very moment. And it'll make a vast difference in their life. We see it all the time. Yesterday on the national show, we were off the air less than two hours, and I got a two or three page letter from a young lady by the name of Kyla who <coughs> tapped in, who tapped in to what we were talking about and reached out to us. And we're going to help make a difference in that young lady's life. So your story is very powerful. It's very important. Now, Gregory uh, sits before you, camera on, with his name out. If you don't want the camera on you, that's okay. If you want to change your name to, like, Betty, you ought to be a woman if it's Betty, if not Bob. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, anonymous is okay. What's important is the story. And, and I'm going to challenge you right now. Don't say, well, I don't want to go on the show because I don't want somebody to know who I am. Really? Your, your sobriety is, is that personal that you can't share it with somebody else? So you're not 12-stepping it at all. You just got sober for you, and that's it. That you, don't, you don't care about anything else. I know that's tough to hear, and I don't mean to offend you. 
But I don't understand when people have the gift of sobriety and they have this amazing group of 12 steppers around them, why they won't step forward to share it publicly because somebody out there needs to hear it. The people who listen to this show are not just the addicts and the alcoholics. They're not just the people with hurts, habits, and hangups. They're the moms. They're the dads. They're the brothers. They're the wives. They're the sisters. They're, they're the sons. The pastors. It's the guy in the cubicle next to you. You can smell the jack on his voice, on his breath, when he comes back from lunch. And then about midway in the afternoon, you hear that drawer open. And you hear him take a big swig. And then he goes to the bathroom and he comes back and he's chewing gum. At some point, maybe you're the only guy, the only person, the only human, the only soul that stands between him and death because you know what he's doing. And on this program, we try to, uh, we try to equip you with the skills to know how to help these people, how to reach out. Our guest is Gregory. Gregory, who helped you? Somebody help you? I mean, what, what, what was the point in which you said, that's it, I'm done? Um. <clears throat> my the guy that, that sponsored me today he he made me um it, he made me a proposition sort of to speak um i have went through uh bethel mission and they said well if you want to continue to to for us to support you and shelter you then you need to go sign up for this door faith program and we're going to put you up in there for a year mm -hmm. and i remember that i consciously made the decision that I would stop drinking for a year and then I would go about my business. But Your business being drinking, drinking. and drugging. Okay. Right? But I, I met a guy called that you have to go to meetings and I met a guy named Tim Peltzer and I asked him to sponsor me and he, to, and he told me, he said, listen, if you give this a shot, he said, just, just stay there in Bethel in, in, the, in the door of faith. And, and if you give five years of your life to this recovery, he said, I guarantee you that after five years, you won't recognize your life from what it is today. And I took him up on that proposition. And, you know, I, do, I have not one single regret for that, not one single regret, because it was like, for, for, I said, like, after five years, if I don't like this, I'm free to go pack up my bags. And I'm at four years, and I couldn't think of going back to drinking. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't think of it. Yeah, um, so my sponsor. Too. You're you're fully employed. Mm -hmm. You actually help other people in the program. Mm -hmm. You have people that you are directing, managing inside the company that you work at. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you've done real well, especially yeah. I would imagine if you look back on some of the other peers that you had uh, in Buffalo. You're probably living the life of a king. Yeah, really, d d definitely, and. Um, a lot of people would look at me today and they probably wouldn't even recognize me if I was to go back. They wouldn't, they wouldn't recognize yeah. me. Have you, this is clear off, but I want to ask, have you always been a good dresser? You have, <laughs> you have the coolest clothes. Every time I see you, 12-step well, functions, you are dressed to the hilt. Well, I, I have. I've, I've started dressing a long time ago. I started buying clothes and I just love to dress up. Yeah. I just, I've always have since I was a little boy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, you said Thank you had you. a Powell story that you wanted to share with Lila. Go ahead. You've got yeah. uh, uh, about uh, almost eight minutes. Okay. Uh, um, when I was at, when I was at um, the Bethel Mission, um, I was new to Buffalo. I did not, you know, it was like if they didn't take care of me. Because new to I, Des Moines, you mean? To, new to Des Moines. Yeah. And if they didn't take care of me, if I was to be put out of there, my time was up at the Churches United. I couldn't go back there. So I, I really had nowhere or nobody that would take care of me if I was put out of the door of faith. And I can remember going into Powell for an AA meeting. I had no idea that it was a, a rehab. Oh. No idea at all. Now, I'm a person that has been running to rehabs year after year after year, most of the times for shelter. Okay, and sometimes for recovery, but most of the times it's because I have nowhere else to go. Mm -hmm. And when I walked into there and I realized that I was in a rehab, I felt such a sense of relief. Oh. Yeah, because it was like, you know what? If I do drink, there is a place that I can go 
took and somebody will help me. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget that. That was just a sense of relief because, like I say, I would have had to been living by the river or something because I didn't know anybody here. Yeah. My girlfriend wasn't taking me back in, and it was either Bethel Mission or the Door of Faith. So and it was like uh, if I blew that, I would be out and living in the street trying to get a bus ticket back to Buffalo. Whoa. But I've been doing rehabs, you know, all my life. So that was, I was like, yeah. wow, this is a, I, can, I could come here if I need help. Yeah. You said so, you also used drugs. What kind of drugs? Anything? Yeah, pretty much anything. anything. But it was mainly crack cocaine. Yeah. What oh, kind yeah. of a, uh, uh, when you were inebriated, either with drugs or alcohol, Bob, is, can I use inebriated for drugs too? Or sure. is, is there a better word? No, inebriated is okay? Sure. All right. So when you're inebriated by either drugs or alcohol, what do you like? Because you're a neat guy, well-dressed, well-spoken, intelligent, responsible, yeah. come early, sh you know, l stay late. I mean, you're, you're a good guy. Yeah. What kind of guy were you when you were inebriated? This, this, this tongue that you say is well-spoken, it becomes a razor. Okay. And what I do is I attack people with it, and I hurt people. I mean, I, I try to viciously hurt people. The, the, the violence just comes out. Through my, through my, you know, through the spoken word, I become a very. Na I mean, we all probably know angry, vicious drunks when people are drinking. That's what happens to me. I become antisocial, a uh, violently antisocial, and just, you know, it's amazing that I could sit here and be sober and then start drinking and. Before you know it, that is so hard to believe because oh, you are so kind, really, and sweet and soft-spoken. Oh, but yeah, and to know that that's the way you were. I mean, there's been a yeah. huge transformation in you. Well, yeah, but one drink and I've just yeah. become. If, if, I mean, people has told me that they are surprised that I'm I haven't been beat to death. Whoa! And I've had people that really wanted to hurt me for some of the things that I've said, but yeah. if other people were protecting me. Yeah. You know, luckily. Because Do you feel like you still have that anger underneath? I mean, because it sounds like there was anger underneath, and then you drank, and that came up and out. I believe there's probably still residual anger. Yeah. I mean, I've I've done a lot to put up a lot of that stuff, but I believe that I, I believe that it's there. Yeah. And I believe that if I was to take a drink, that it would it would just come back out. Mm -hmm. Do you hold resentments towards your mother and father? No, no, no. It took me a long time to. It took me all my life to 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 realize that they suffered from alcohol. Yeah. Did yeah, did you, you know. did you know their mom and dad? So your grandparents? Well, on my on my my dad's parents, they took up all of the um they took up they took all of the attention. <coughs> and my 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 mother parents, they were my father made them into the to the scapegoats, or he belittled them, mm. and but I like my grandmother on my mother's side. When I was a little boy, I can remember my mother and father taking me to my mother's house because she was dying upstairs in this house. But we never got to go in there to meet her, and she died, and I never got to meet my grandmother. All I know is that she was up in my in my mm. grandparents' house, which we never went in that house. We always waited outside, and she oh. died shortly after that. I never got to meet her. And she was a full-blooded Native American woman, and mm. I never, never. So, And I just found out, too, that one of my aunts that died from an abortion when I was a little boy, my favorite aunt, I didn't realize, because I was a little boy of three, four, five years old, that she was only 16 years old. Oh. And I she did. died from a botched from, abortion? From a botched abortion, late, late 60s. Beginning mm. of the seventies. What did what what were what did they tell you happened to Aunt? They never talked about it. The, my the, my my grandparents on my father's side they never told us to explain it. To, and and that lady that aunt she was out of all my aunts she was a loving and kind one. The other ones were mean. And it's mm. sad yeah. that I never got to find out anything about her. She was just beautiful. So. So, um, it's amazing some of those things you find out so many years afterwards. Mm -hmm, yeah. And how, how would that have made a difference in your life, Gregory, had you known that your uh, aunt died from a botched abortion? Would that have? How no, would... I knew that. We knew that she died from an abortion. Okay. But they never talked about it. Oh, okay. Yeah, we knew that, but they never they never explained it what an abortion was, what happened. But we heard, we knew it. Was. the thing that I didn't know is that she was only sixteen years mm -hmm. old. Yeah. 
That's what I didn't know. Now, now you said that your brother Sam, who we've got a picture of here, who uh, passed away a few years ago from just his body. That was this year, yeah. This year. Mm-hmm. Um, what should the system have been able to provide for him to help him? The system. The system provided. They did everything they could for him. Okay. He was, did yeah. he not take his medication for schizophrenia? He took it, but he became very abusive toward it. He would take mm-hmm. it sometimes. He wouldn't take it then. Yeah. yeah, he was He was really a bad case. He, was, he wouldn't work with the system because, like I say, he was still tied into my family and their alcoholism, trying to be a part of that and help that yeah. instead of taking care of himself. himself yeah. So, I mean, he suffered like that for 20 years easy. Yeah. So, is he your little brother or big brother? He is my older brother. Older brother. Yeah. All the siblings still alive? Yeah, except for Sam. Except for Sam. And and when some, when I lost my brother Sam, I finally I knew what it meant when people say you lose a part of yourself. Mm. Yes. Yeah. I I knew what they were talking about because it was like I lost a part of myself. So. Wow, you didn't yeah. feel that when mom and dad died. No, nowhere near that, and that was amazing. Yeah. It was like I did not feel that at all, at yeah. all. Yeah, I yeah I uh, so, I, I have not lost either of my parents, and I'm not looking forward to it. Yeah. I mean, so, I, but when my dog dies. I'm a wreck. I mean, I yeah. am a pathetic wreck. I can't imagine what's going to happen when my, my one of my parents dies. Yeah. Hopefully, maybe I'll go before them. Yeah. That'll save me from that. I just wanted to say we just started a new meeting and um, I caught the inner city group. It's a 12-step meeting over on the, the north side of us, right over there by Bethel Mission. Okay. And it's, man, I am really excited about well, We're going to talk about New Year's resolutions, but if you can hang around with us a little bit I'm longer. I'm not going nowhere. All right, you stay right where you're at. We're here live on Recovery Monday from Powell CDC. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. I'm Brian Leach, owner and general manager of Service Legends. Oh, I brought uh, along a couple of the uh, home comfort heroes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tammy Wells. I am Nick Wondershot. I'm administrative manager. I'm the senior technician. I'm Service Legends. It seems like every good thing, when you feel it to the bone that it's good, there's a lot of hard work put behind it. You just, I, I don't think that you can fake it and have it turn out good. You know, if we seem like, okay, that's just weird, it's just a furnace, why would you believe so deeply in a furnace? It's not just that, you know, we want to show the world that you can have good service. Yeah, I mean, it's gotta be, it's your home. You know, it's, it's built into our daily trainings, it's built into our culture, um, that we're gonna do whatever it takes to have each client say they love us, period. That's why we spend all the hours in the training that we do, and if we guarantee it's gonna be a good experience for you, or else it's free, what type of work do you think we're gonna do? <laughs> there is a guarantee. Temperature selection guarantee, fixed rider it's free guarantee, comfort guarantee, best value guarantee, all of these guarantees hold us accountable to ensuring that we exceed your expectations. And if for whatever reason we'd fail and we can't make it right, we guarantee all of those guarantees with a 100% money back guarantee. I mean, if you don't think that your technician can fix it right, are you going to say that to a client? No. <laughs> you don't have to worry about having a technician come to your house. We drug test, background check all of our team members. We put safe people in your home. Each and every one of our service techs, 400 hours a year in training. You tell it the minute they walk in the door. They know what they're doing, they've done their homework, and they actually truly care about what you want. Because at the end of the day, you're the person that makes sure I have a job. They're going to be listening. They're going to want to know what your challenges are. Then they're going to come and give you options, and, and you get to choose. If I'm there to help and I make it easy and painless, I did my job right that day. Well, when it comes to your comfort, safety, and your family, you know, you don't necessarily go buy the most expensive, but you get the most bang for your buck. Oh, it's worth it, because there's a lot of people that will find a way to get it to work right now, and then leave, and then come back, charge you again, and, and the cycle just repeats itself. So when I'm out there looking at the furnace, I want to find why it failed the day. How can we change the part today with something that you're not going to have to worry about? Is it worth changing the part today? I mean, you can put a lot of money into a furnace. I can fix parts all day. There's good job security in that for me. But is it the right thing for you? I get a lot of the phone calls of after the technicians are there. They're just in awe. They're like, wow, you guys are great. I mean, I don't even know what to say. You guys are great. Everything you did was perfect. It's great. <laughs> Keep going, though. I like this. <laughs> just give us a try. I'm going to take all the risk. I've got the time to make this right. I've got the support to make it right. Just check us out. And if you don't see the value in what we do. I mean, fixed writer, it's free or 100% money back. Enough said.
22 minutes before the top Salem Radio Network news at 4 o'clock and then 4.03. It's, um, yep, True Blue with Pastor Michael Mudloff for West Kirk Presbyterian Church. We continue our last Recovery Monday with our special guest, Gregory, four years sober. Sobered up right after moving here after, man, a lifetime of drugs and alcohol. And um, now you're you're just doing great. It's, it's really a story of... Of, of what a 12-step program can do for somebody, your, your story. But we want to talk a little bit and hang around with us. Uh, first of all, finish your conversation about that new meeting. I want to make sure we get that information out right. Oh, okay. Um, <coughs> when, when, when I moved here to Des Moines, I, I noticed that over there in the, in the 6th Avenue <coughs> University that there was no meetings over there. And that's a tough area. That's a really tough area. You got the Bethel Mission over there, Salvation Army. Um, it's the quick trip and all of that. They're doing it. The, you got the plasma place. They're selling them blood all the time. So anyway, they got this Evelyn Davis Center opened up that's affiliated with the um, with DMAC. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful facility. And in my heart, I said, that is the place where I want to start a meeting at. And this meeting, there was a meeting in Buffalo. It is a meeting called the Inner City Group, was which I was a member, very fond of it. I said, I'm going to start a meeting at over in that location and call it the Inner City Group. And it's on Saturday mornings at 11 o'clock. And we're looking forward to start an Inner City Group, too, on Wednesday evenings at 8 o'clock, right down the street from there. Cool. So, and we're looking for, I'm looking for those guys that's coming right off the street. Is it a 12-step meeting, big book reading, speaker step, meeting? It's, well, it's, a, it's, it's based on the daily reflections, and uh, we do that uh, all of the weeks of the month except the last week, and then I'll have a speaker come in. Okay. So I'm always looking for speakers to come in um, that they can identify people from that area. And I take a meeting out to Mecca on Friday nights, and I'm always letting them know about this new group mm -hmm. because Mecca's a tough crowd. Yeah. I love going out there. I um. I got two guys that I sponsor out of there. They came out together and they're staying sober. They're, support, they're celebrating their six months. Cool. And they're staying sober. And it's so hard to catch them coming out of there. It's yeah. really hard to catch them. Yeah. You know. You're, uh, you're, I mean, you're becoming a leader in your community of sobriety. Uh, what would you say to a 17, 18, 19-year-old punk kid who's, got five or six years of a drinking career and drugging career behind him, and he thinks he's, uh, you know, he thinks he's Superman. He, he'll never end up like you, you know? Yeah. Well, it's, it's really hard to catch them when they are out there like that. You have to catch them once they hit a brick wall. Absolutely. You know, because when, you're, when they're out there and if, if they feel invincible, they're untouchable, and it's like you can't really reach them. They're not open. They're not receptive until they have a, you know, a run in with the law. They lose their license when they're forced to, and they're hurting. Yeah. That's that's really the only way that it works. They're at but, the bottom is when they listen. Yeah. Cause yeah. at that age, I was vicious. Yeah. Nobody, you wasn't coming to me to talk to me about nothing. I was gonna try to rob you. Part of it's the yeah. age too, because they yeah. just don't think it. Their their brains aren't developed yet. But you so know, you always hear that that we we mellow with age. I know a lot of guys my age that are just mean and angry. <laughs> They're not mellowing at all. Yeah. Well, I guess yeah. I guess people are like that. I I try to stick around people more like myself. Yeah, mellowed you know, out. So. All right. So um, you got anything on uh, New Year's resolution? Well, yeah, my New Year's resolution this year is to to be more, you know, internal instead of external. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I continue to think that what I need is outside of me yeah. and it's inside of me. Yeah. And there is just, there's so much out there in the way of spirituality and all of it leads to the to inside. And, you know, I've all my life I've tried to be you know, put on a good act to look good, to mm -hmm. sound good, that. But the real thing is that I'm finally comfortable with doing this. Mm -hmm. Before I thought I had to do it, I was forced to go inside. You know, you got to go inside and look. But now it's like I want to take that journey inside. Yeah. And it's okay. Whatever's going on outside of me is okay because I believe that it's on what's inside is what is going to take care of everything. And you said you're spiritual? You're more spiritual now? Well, I'm more interested in genuine spirituality as opposed to being told that I must be spiritual in order to remain s sober and clean. What, what do you call the, the, your higher power? My higher power? 
Um, right now, I'm looking for enlightenment. Okay. You know, I'm not looking for a God sort of speak, but I'm looking for a spiritual enlightenment where I find the path that is right for me myself. And my recovery, it just cleans me up so that I can begin to take that journey inside. Do you think that path is already laid out before you and you've got to find it, or do you need to blaze that path? I believe that, I believe it's a combination of both. I believe that um, there's people that I can look to that can lead me, that I must follow, but at the same time, I believe because I'm an individual, because we have so much potential, um, that I can, I can do both. I have to do both. Bob, I want to break out my Bible and start preaching here, but I'm not going to do it. Um, all right, good for you. All right, New Year's resolution, Lila. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm good at making these, and I usually stick to them. Really? Yeah. Well, my sobriety birthday is um, the day after New Year's. It was a New Year's resolution. And, um, and because I stuck with that, in my head, it's like I'm good at this, so I can do it. So every year... Um, Actually, I have my family, we, we all write goals, different areas in our life that yeah. we're going to achieve for that year. And in fact, before Tyler left today, he ran through some things that he was going to do. And he, he does monthly goals. But um, mine is, I have to get back on track with my eating. It's, um, I, for the last two months, I've just gotten totally off track. Okay, I don't know what that means. You, 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 I you am have a, an eating disorder. Yeah, I just am addicted to certain foods. Okay. And what ha it's just like alcohol, that it, it triggers the pleasure center in my brain, and once I eat those foods, I can't stop. So I haven't had potato chips in like maybe 30 years, and I don't drink pop because if I start, I can't stop. I don't eat candy bars because I, if I start, I can't stop. And for a long time, for this last year, I've gone without white bread and anyway, a lot of things, but then I start picking it up again. So I just have to get back on track. And my father was a doctor, and he used to say, just eat meat, fruit, and vegetables, and you're going to be fine. And I, some way, I just have to simplify my life like that instead of complicating it all the time and eating this stuff that I know once I start, I feel horrible. I mean, after this vacation time now, this period, I just I feel horrible emotionally. I feel horrible physically because I've been eating all this junk food that doesn't do anything for me. So, so... Uh, you, you might find a, an alcoholic at the side of the building outside Quick Trip with a bottle of Thunderbird wine. We'll find you with three musketeers, Lay's, potato chips, and a big two-liter bottle of root beer. Absolutely. And is that, uh, this is a serious question. Is that as serious for you as your alcoholism? Yes. Probably worse. W what happens if you, quote, unquote, fall off the wagon with food? Something terrible happens in your life and you just, I'm going to eat. And I'm a drink pop. Well, you that's, don't touch alcohol or drugs. Right. But uh, it, it doesn't have the, the immediate consequences that liquor did, you know, where you have all this, re I mean, you were regretting it to other people, wondering what you said, what you did, yeah. and all that stuff. But internally, what goes on in my head is just, I'm, I'm beating myself up. Okay. And it's, um, but the, the physical part is horrible. I mean, I... In the last year, I've gained between 15 and 20 pounds. Really? Mm -hmm. You don't look like it. And wow. I know everybody says that, but in my head, daily, all day long, I'm shaming myself, putting that, myself down. But that, okay. What? Well, I, I'm going to go spiritual on you, and I don't want to do that with Powell, because you guys are, 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 you're really good about allowing people to have the, the spirituality, i.e. religion, whatever suits them. So uh, w what I would tell you is that's just the accuser beating you up. <coughs> you know, you, you've defeated him on alcohol. He had a plan for your life that you were going to be a drunk your whole life. Yeah. And you beat him, what, 27 years ago? Yeah, I'll be 28. Wednesday. You beat him 28 years ago. So now he just finds something else that he's going to plug yeah. into your head, and it's called food. And, and that, that shame and guilt comes from the accuser. It doesn't come from you. you got to shut it off. you got to push it away. Say, no way. In the name of my higher power, you have no right to live in my head rent-free. And I can do that sometimes. When, I, when I'm strong, there isn't anything that gets in yeah. my path. Mm -hmm. can right. I, can no, I... We're going to come back. got okay. a hard break. We're coming back. George talks first, and then I'll talk about my bucket list a little bit. Here on Recovery Monday on Powell CDC.
father who is headed toward another heart attack. A woman who struggles daily with diabetes and her memory. A boy whose headaches keep him out of school. A mother who one morning discovers a lump. A girl whose condition defies diagnosis. You come to us because you need answers, but you also need more. You need understanding of what you're going through. You need comfort. You need to be treated as an individual, not a condition. You need to be included in your own care. You are the point of everything we do. That's why we're changing to Unity Point Health. It's a model of care that will help us work better together, where the physician who knows you best takes the lead, coordinating your care through every step, from the hospital to specialists, to rehabilitation, to health services in the home and in the community, to making sure the treatments are effective. By working as a team, we surround you with care, helping you manage your health and your conditions, guiding you to making better choices and living a healthier life. The point of unity is you. Unity Point Health. If you choose to obey the power of sin, it leads to death. If you choose to obey obedience, it leads to righteousness. Forgiveness is just the beginning of life in Christ. God wants us to live for Him now. And because of Jesus Christ, the gospel was preached, and you and I are blessed today because of Abraham. Did you know that? We're blessed. Experience Truth, 99.3 FM. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Okay, we're back. Ten before the top Salem Radio Network news. Uh, bad news uh, in Des Moines. We've had a man who has been uphold, uh, holding himself up in his house in Waukee. He started about 1230 in the morning this morning or just after midnight last night. Uh, Waukee police has reported that he has uh, committed suicide. And uh, it's always sad when that becomes the point in which somebody gets to. But it's happening more and more and more. I think we're going to see more suicides by cop as time goes on. Uh, the um, people are being taught that their 15 minutes of fame, if it can't come on a football field or during a ballet dance or because they're uh, made a citizen of the year from their community, well, maybe they'll go out with a bang. And uh, it's sad that we've gotten to that place in society that people think they're so entitled that they even think they're entitled to hurt other people or take their own life in the end. Let's pray for those people. All right, we're talking a little bit about uh, New Year's resolutions and bucket lists, and uh, uh, Lila was talking about how uh, her food disorder has has triggered, and uh, she's gained more weight than she wanted to this year, and so you're going to uh, lose that weight? Yes, in a healthy way. And what does that mean? To eat meat, fruit, and vegetables, I guess. And and I also have to... Um, I'm saying this on the radio, so I will do it. I see. You have to exercise. <laughs> um, I exercise. And and for us living in Des Moines, it's hard for me. I don't belong to any of those clubs anymore because I've wasted so many of those. Yeah. But I just am going to go to the mall. And walk. Yeah. And I've done that before. I've done it for years, but I quit doing it for a while. Yeah. Okay. Just, now, you wanted to add something, George, as we got to the end of her conversation. Oh, yeah. Be- um. You know, when I came here to Des Moines and and I would wander the rooms, you know, the recovery rooms, you know, I saw people that were strong and I saw what they what they had and what they wanted. And ever since I when I first saw you, it was you just had show so much strength, you know, and you'll be you just don't know how attractive that is for me when I see somebody that is really strong, has a really good uh, program, and is doing a lot, that that just is like another, that's just like watering whatever seed there is in me for my recovery, and you've done that to me. I've always thought that you was a very, very strong woman. Well, and thank I've you. Always, you've made a difference in my life, and it's the people that don't even know it, mm-hmm. that I'm watching, they don't even know that I'm watching them, like my sponsor. I had never heard my sponsor open his mouth when I asked him to sponsor me, but I used to watch him. And it was something about the way he carried himself. 
and it's been a great relationship. I'm glad you said that because that'll give me strength then to, to do what I have to do now. Yeah. You know, if, mm-hmm. It's interesting. When I was a young boy growing up in Beatrice, Nebraska, there was a kid that lived down the street from me that was uh, a hotshot tennis player, but he was shorter than I was, and he was three or four years older. And his name was Bill Roach. And Bill said something walking down the street one day. He said, remember something, Mac. It's not the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog. Mm-hmm. And Bill disappeared. I moved across town. He graduated. And last week, I found out where he was. And so I called him last Saturday, and I got to share with him just what you shared today with Lila, that the dif- what, what difference he had made in my life back in 1968 or 69. In fact, for those of you that know me, I've got my six-page business card. Machism 22 is, it's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the fly- size of the fight mm-hmm. in the dog. And I've said that to people years over years over years in sobriety and outside of sobriety. You're never the underdog unless you post yourself as the underdog. Yeah. So, um, all right. So beyond beyond the the, the weight thing, what else? Um, Is that the only one? It's well, okay. Well, that, that like takes over my mind. But I always challenge myself. I, I always want to learn something new um, and challenge myself at work, um, have new goals there. And um, when you're when you're a, when you're a substance abuse cal- uh, uh, counselor like you are, I would imagine it's hard to set goals at work because you're really chasing everybody else's goals. Well, for me, uh, my job's sort of changing, and I'm going to be in charge of aftercare, um, which I have been before, but now I'm going to concentrate on that, and it's to get more people in. To aftercare. aftercare and to make it attractive so people understand what it is so it can be a support system to them. There's so many people that need a good support system, and, and I af- believe we have it. Aftercare is somewhere between in and outpatient and meetings, right? Correct. It, it's a little more concentrated than meetings, but not quite as much as... We have between 7 and 15 people in a group. It's a, it's a peer-led group where they get feedback. And in 12-step meetings, you don't get feedback. You're right. one-sided. You just tell what's right. going on. But this, you get feedback, and so people help each other. But And we have people in groups that have been there for 20, 30 years. Wow, in the same group. In the same group. Boy, those people know each other well. They know each other. <laughs> all their secrets, everything. Yeah, they yeah. are very supportive of each other. We always put new people in there so that they can help new people, too. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, you know, I've, uh, I've gotten to the point in my life where I no longer have New Year's resolutions. I have a tremendous amount of gratitude <coughs> for uh, my higher power, which I choose to call Jesus, and um, for the things that he's done in my life. I had a 16-year drinking career, and I've been sober 1,331 days, so a little <laughs> over three and a half years. And I'm to the point where I'm, I'm able to help people, you know? And um, it's interesting because the gift of notoriety um, feeds an ego, all right? Mm-hmm. That same gift that God gave me called notoriety, I now use because there are people who recognize me from being in the media for so long and they can relate to me. And that happened today. Uh, a young man sitting to my right, it's a, he's at his very first meeting ever. And he is two days sober and he's gonna do it on his own. Mm. And I opened my mouth to say something, and he turned around and he looked at me. And it's that look of, oh, that's the voice. Oh. This guy's listened to me for 15 years. Oh. And we talked for 10, 15 minutes after the meeting, and he said, you know, if you can do this, I know I can do this. He, oh. said, he said, can I see you at this meeting every Monday? I said, here's my number. Call me anytime. And then he asked if I could give him a ride home. And he said, sure. And I gave him a ride home. And he almost had tears coming down his eyes. I said, I, I can't believe I finally got to meet you. And, and you and I are in this same program together. I'm going to hold that man to a higher level of accountability because he kind of gives me that responsibility. Yeah. So, um, but this year, one of the things I want to do this year, I want to, I want to, I want to witness an autopsy. Oh, where did that come from? I don't know. Just, <laughs> my, it comes from hanging around with a forensic scientist for five years. But uh, What do you hope to get out of it? Um, humility. Understanding how frail the body is oh, okay. and what we do to it. And um, I mean, the first time I had an OWI, they sent me to that whatever it was down at Methodist. And the lady calls out a healthy liver and then howls out the terrible liver, you know, and so I saw that. 
I just, I want to know myself. I want to know mankind. I want to know us as humans. I'm experimenting tremendously in the uh, spiritual world. I want to do the same in the physical world. So I just want to know. So that's one of the things. You know, now that you say that, it might help. It might help people treat their bodies yeah, differently. That's what I'm hoping. I, did, I saw that thing where they had those um, in <laughs> Las Vegas. Those 10 pounds of fat. No, they were. <clears throat> oh, I've seen that too. But people that had died and they. Oh, yeah. They cut them in half. Yeah. yeah. All right, Lila, thank you very much for the time that you've spent with us on Recovery Monday, and we look forward to 52 awesome shows next year. George, thanks for being our guest. Mm -hmm. Mr. Montserrat, thanks for being my co-host and partner. Ryan, thanks for producing. And for the last time in 2013, I simply just ask you to pray. <laughs>